Welcome to Youthful Idiots. I'm Katie Halper. And I'm Matt Taibbi. This week, we're mixing it up a little bit because we have so much great material. So the four basic food groups is in our Substack only segment. But we got some great stuff for you that we think we'll, you will really enjoy. Uh, the, yeah, the world hates each other right right now, right? That's that's basically the headline because of the Georgia thing, right? Yeah, I guess I don't think it's a, as uh, I think it's pretty consistent with like recent history trends. That's true. That's true. Matt that- all of a sudden is like, you know, there's a lot of hate in this world. <laughs> You think you hadn't written a book called uh, Hate Hate Inc. Inc. Right, exactly. You also wrote another book, which no one, which you never talk about. Which one? The drug dealer book. Business Secrets of Drug Dealing? We'll get to it. Yeah. We'll get to it. All right. You got to leave people wanting more? That's like the only, that's like the, the, of all the books I've written, it's the one that I'm probably most proud of, but I never talk about it. Yeah. You know what? We should offer Substack only people a Matt Taibbi book club. (laughs) <laughs> what would happen in the Matt Taibbi book? They, would, they could ask you questions. We could just read your books. God, I don't even want to join that club. I mean, yeah, I'll run it. Okay. Katie Helper's Matt Taibbi book club. And then they can ask me questions and I'll just guess. Katie, right. what was Matt thinking? Well, you know, Matt was thinking, I think we were both thinking, you know, was, when I was interviewing Goldman Sachs people. Right, right, right. What was the inspiration for this phrase? Right? Yeah, no, yeah. but I think people, yeah, we should read your books. So uh, also people keep asking about people did a video about about our our going rogue and they really were like I can't believe they did that with, for, because of the serious stuff. Really? Yeah. So someone actually did a video of that? Yeah. Can the I Vanguard. See it? And you know, today we're going to reveal what really happened and really why we're not at Rolling Stone anymore. Oh, it was it had to be because of the Midas thing, Midas Foundation thing, right? Uh, Cuz they were secretly Saudi funded and we we objected to that. That's Thank you, Matt, for bringing that up. Right? Do you want to, you finally want to explain? Disclose it. When we found out about all that Saudi money and the connections between Roger Penske and Trump, we just bailed. We bailed. We were like, we stand. Morally, we can't have any of this. We can't. And we like Yemen. And right. we like, I mean, we, Wait, we're we like mixed. the war in Yemen or Yemen? No, we don't like the war in Yemen. We like Yemen. We like Yemenis. And, and people in, in Yemen. People, although we do feel conflicted because of the, when Yemeni kids get too tall. Right, we remember? like them short. Yeah, well, why was it, what was our reason? We don't, because if they are too tall, they can bite bad areas. Oh, right, right. So you got to keep them like below thigh Yeah, level. certain height, yeah. <laughs> right, so, so yeah, so we're conflicted there. That's a silver the silver lining. Let's, the silver we'll line. say it's silver lining, yeah. yeah. Well, that was what was keeping us at Rolling Stone that whole time. That we were towing the party line, <laughs> right? Because pro we starving children in Yemen line, and you right. know what? We couldn't do it anymore because honestly, I like chubby kids. I don't like emaciated kids. Right. You like I mean, them I don't, short, short and chub. Oh yeah, right. But okay, I'm half behind the 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 this devastation there because short is good, but I like chubby. <laughs> so right. that's what pushed me. Oh, okay. Here we're gonna. Here we're taking off the mask. Look, we were fine pushing the pro Saudi war against Yemen, um, famine, cholera thing. That whole thing. Right. People didn't notice that we actually injected pro Saudi messages. Yeah. Throughout, throughout all subliminal. eighty episodes that we did yeah. at Rolling Stone. Yeah. And then you know, I think one day you wake up and you realize, what am I doing? I'm that eighty first time. That eighty first time. We were like, I, I can't push the Saudi the Saudi uh, war against Yem- the people of Yemen anymore, even though I like short kids, but I like them chubby. And you can't, you just cannot have you starvation. Can't compromise. You can't compromise. And you can't, you know, at the end yeah, of the day. Right, right. Because once you give that little tiny bit, next thing you know, it's a generation of short, skinny kids. Right. Not short right? chubs. Right. Short yeah, chubs exactly. is okay. Very cute. Easy Here. to take around with you. And safe. And safe, you mean like for padding? like? Well, no, because they won't bite. Oh, right. But if you have to pick them up, that's the problem. Right, right. that is the problem. But right. they also are safe because you throw them in the water, they'll bounce. Not, not bounce, <laughs> float. <laughs> they'll float. And if you throw them on the ground, they'll bounce too. You right. know, so this is the type of thing that you can't get away with saying at Rolling Stone. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's all this stuff that we wanted to get off our chest, but we just couldn't. And yeah. finally, it was that conflict with that, you know, 
Penske Trump Saudi dominated version of Rolling Stone. Yeah, that's that, not the version that we signed up to work with. We didn't. We didn't sign up to work yeah. with that. Yeah. Yeah. We, not we just on our watch. Ju just, just for the uh, the Penske Trump version, not the pro Saudi right. version. Right. right. Oh no, yeah. I'm sorry. It was the pro Saudi version, not the Penske Trump version. Is oh, this any of this true, by the way? Like, is any of the Saudi Rolling Stone stuff true? I don't know. I mean, the 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 Trump thing is ridiculous. What, mean, what's that? A, 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 the allegation by this group, I think they're called the Midas Foundation, um, is that you know, basically. Rolling Stone is a pro-Trump enterprise because the, because of Roger Penske's connection to you know to Trump. I guess he received a medal or something from Trump. I mean, does anyone ever read the people who were saying this? Have they read Rolling Stone in the last five yeah. years? Yeah. I mean, it, it, I think it's literally one hundred percent negative about Trump. There, there was I can't think of a single article that they ever wrote that was anything but uh, completely negative about Trump. And that, you know, going against our because we wanted to do all this pro-Trump propaganda, right? And they they wouldn't even let us. This is good. We got to generate more controversy, and also now people are going to have to do another expose. Now that they know it's actually Yemen related, Saudi Yemen related. What show is this again? The Vanguard. They their 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 shtick is like they talk about kind of online controversies, like like YouTube online controversies. Uh, this is one of those weirder forms of media censorship, and I'm surprised that this hasn't gotten more coverage from yes. uh, BreadTube, considering the. Uh, magnitude uh, of the of the show. Obviously, people are probably aware that Useful Idiots on Rolling Stone <laughs> has moved, uh, and it's now going to Substack. Right, uh, Katie Halper and Matt Taibbi uh, you were, order. you know, hosts of. I, and it was an extremely popular show on Rolling Stone. I mean, average their videos. You can look; they'll get anywhere from like one hundred and eighty thousand views to like two hundred and fifty thousand views. I'm sure it was also available on. Uh, you know, Spotify, cool. Apple Podcasts, yeah. whatever. Uh, instead of, um, you know, renewing their contract, keeping the podcast going, uh, you, you know, Rolling Stone cut the cut the program. Uh, Matt Taibbi had, you know, publicly left Rolling Stone on good terms and continued, or, you know, a few months back, I believe last year, um, but continued to do uh, Useful Idiots uh, with Katie Halper. Um then it was announced that they would be leaving and going to the Substack model, uh, similarly to how uh, Matt had. It was unclear. They hadn't really publicly addressed why that occurred. Uh, finally, in the first episode of their podcast, as it's uploaded on YouTube, uh, check it out, everybody. They interviewed Daniel Ellsberg, but they kind of address the transition, and I wanted to just respond to it a little bit and talk about yeah, it. Yeah, we can just play the first couple of minutes of this and then respond, because, yeah, they do kind of okay. get to why... Um, they were cut from Rolling Stone. Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm one of your hosts, Katie Halper. And I'm the other, Matt Taibbi. How are you, Katie? I'm good, you? I'm doing well, I'm doing well. Yeah, um, you know, a lot of people have questions about mm. what happened uh, yeah. and why why we're no longer Rolling Stone. We consciously uncoupled from Rolling Stone. Is that really true, though? I mean, no, I think we've, we've, been, we've been telling people that it was an amicable break. Amicable, yeah. Break. But the, the truth is that it was political. It was political. Um, yeah. Uh, should, I just come for, should I just come clean? I think you should just admit it. All right. So, uh, you know, you cost us both our jobs. So. I did. Um, I cost us both of our jobs. I created this great opportunity, though, for us to come to Substack. So and, you know, a lot yeah. of people were calling me an Assadist and calling Matt by extension an Assadist. And I was trying to, I was pretending that, you know, our severing with Rolling Stone or their severing ties with us wasn't related to Syria, but it absolutely was. Okay. Oh my God. It's such a relief to say that. So we had political differences and I wanted to open up a studio in um, Damascus. I, like I wanted useful, right. idiots, useful idiots Damascus. Damascus. Yeah. I wanted a DT uh, Damascus today. They wouldn't even talk about putting into the contracts. And they wouldn't air that glowing profile uh, slash interview that you had done with, uh, with Bashar al-Assad. Al Bashar al-Assad, yeah. 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 So, you know, we basically, all right, I wanted Assad to be the third host. Right. <laughs> I, I thought the chemistry wasn't quite there. It's off screen. There are a lot of fireworks. But you're right. It just doesn't translate on screen. Like right. when he and I are hanging out, there's a lot of chemistry and like everyone notices it, right. but it just doesn't work on screen. Yes. So, I mean, for Matt, for you, it was a creative difference with Rolling Stone. I think that maybe they wouldn't have got, gone on board, even if the online chemistry had been more apparent. Yeah. So they're pretty much joking around at this point, but. Yeah. So essentially to kind of. Uh, for people who didn't follow the show or aren't aware of the situation, essentially the joke is is that, um, and, and a joke which is rooted in reality, which is the, the fact that it, they're basically confirming that Rolling Stone parted ways 
uh, with useful idiots because of their coverage on Syria, uh, having people on the show like uh, Aaron Mate, um, uh, you know, uh, taking into account Katie Halper's personal show and her coverage and, you know, obviously her Twitter personality. I think that that was uh, essentially what they were implying got the show uh, axed. Uh, and also the fact that they didn't have Matt's cloud as a, you know, probably the biggest name at Rolling Stone uh, mm-hmm. holding it down for them. You know, a culmination of those two things, I would suspect, um, resulted in them being like, this isn't, you know, the yeah. uh, juice isn't worth the squeeze for us, blah, blah, blah. We can't have all this hate that we're getting from crazy. our media people. But- I just think it's crazy that you, as a company or corporation, be like, let's have Matt Taibbi and Katie Halper do a podcast together. And then a year in, it's like, Oh, they said something that was controversial. So now it's like, what did you expect? They literally happen? named like, their podcast useful. Yeah. Sense. Like <laughs> it, it's the kind of the reason people watch that show in the first place was to hear opinions from outside of the political mainstream. So again, uh, I don't understand the logic behind this at all. Um, like, were they given a list of talking points that they weren't a lo- supposed to yes. say anything about? And then this yes. was one that they That's decided exactly to talk right. about regardless. Like, yeah, it, it just seems such like a brazen violation yes, of yes, their yes. right yes. to express themselves freely mm-hmm. on the platform, which Rolling Stone provided them. So mm-hmm. uh, again, this is why I could never work for a fucking corporation. Mm-hmm. Um, stuff like this, you know, I don't want to have to be, well, it's kind of the green. final straw, right? People always want to bash Matt Taibbi for going on this these independent outlets. It's like, what, what the fuck do you want? Do you want, People that are going to pacify themselves and play the yeah. fucking game and appease the mm, advertisers, like, um, you know, I don't, uh, I don't think Jan Werner even owns Rolling Stone anymore, right? So, oh, I, I think that you know, at the end of the day, it's just there, you know, there's no anchor in like anybody that would you know value like journalistic integrity, right? At this point, it's just a conglomeration that's about milking. Uh, as much money out of it as possible. So if advertisers start to get pissed at Rolling Stone magazine because they're talking about this stuff or whatever, uh, there's going to be no integrity as far as like, oh, we're going to keep doing this because it's the right thing to do because the reporting is correct. Um, Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I just think it's crazy again that um, such benign comments ended up, you know, resulting in this decision. Uh, I guess the Syria thing is super controversial still in in mainstream media circles. Well, it's just because they refuse to acknowledge it, right? And even if, as soon as yeah. you start platforming people who accurately point out the massive failure of the entire media structure of America, which everybody from Fox News to I mean, Matt Taibbi now does that. This, like, shit. Matt Taibbi has pointed that out. That's what I'm saying. It's just stupid about this. Decision. Well, that's what I mean. I think it's because he left Rolling Stone as a full time reporter. He no longer had the clout within the company to like make it worthwhile having him on in that capacity. That's what I imagine, yeah. uh, but I don't know, right? They, I wish that they would have given us, uh, you know, given more information. Essentially, the point of doing this, you know, oh, thing was, I. I just wanted to be like, you know, fuck Rolling Stone, basically. Yeah, we should have them on. We should have them do a segment about uh, this. Yeah, where 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 they're watching us, watching them, yeah. watching us. Right. Watching them, watching us. <laughs> there is a, uh, we can get like a singularity kind of a thing going, right? Where where we all kind of go back in time and we're yeah. each other's parents and everything. I think Back to the Future. Right, it'll be Back to the Future, but yeah, a, as we go through the conversation, like our our appearances will change and our photo, people will vanish from our photos and stuff. Right. Like that. Let's hear the the end of it, the rest of it. I like the guy's hat. Yeah, me too. Got that kind it, of smoky kind of, hot look. I like it. Yeah, it blends in though with the background, so it That's just true, makes, yeah. makes it look like it doesn't. You know what? It's a lie. I don't know how he pulls it off, but it's red on red, and it doesn't blend in. It works. What's, what's the flag? Oh, fuck around and find out, probably. Fuck around and find yeah. out. I like it. Like, in the business really to is- Substack, but like, what the fuck is the alternative when even journalists with the clout of Matt Taibbi can't have these conversations on a corporate sanctioned platform? Uh, like, you can't blame people for going to a space where they're not going to have their speech restricted and where their topics of conversations uh, can be freely, you know, curated. It, it, it's crazy. Why, why would you not do that? If you Especially have when you can bring your own audience and take it all away. Like, who the fuck is reading anything from Rolling Stone now? Yeah, I mean, and, and well, that's what's crazy, too, about this story is that I was under the impression that Rolling Stone was really trying hard to, like, go back to the roots of being, like, the cool, uh, you know, outlet for politics and music and all that. Uh, and and usefully it's fit right in with that kind of brand or vision, you know, having the more edgy voices on their platform does make people like me and you, uh, it draws them to the platform. So 
uh, you know, what are they going to rep- I don't want to fucking listen to useful idiot if it's idiots if it's hosted by Ezra Klein and you know Samantha B or whatever the fuck. Like, I'm not going to listen to that. I want to listen to their program that's hosted by Matt Taibbi and Katie Helper. And go. now I'm going to listen to it on Substack and not yeah. Rolling Stone. So, yeah. again, I just don't see how this is a, a good decision on their part uh, as a company. Um, it, it makes no sense to me. Um, cause they already have that kind of like centrist, uh, block down. I mean, anyone that goes to Rolling Stone for their news is probably not like a firebrand fucking progressive. So they already have the kind of more mainstream centristy demographic on lock. It seemed like this was kind of their attempt to, to reach out to people like us. I'm interested in our story now. I know me too. I mean, right? it just, what happened? I don't know. We're going to have to have uh, them on to tell us the Vanguard. <laughs> Maybe they did some more research. I'm just saying that I think that mutually it might end up being a funny segment if if our podcast talks to their podcast, talks back to our podcast continually until we get sort of an endless loop of until us Rolling talking Stone. about them, talking about us, talking right. about them, talking about us, talking right. about them. Like it, it could it could be like the mirrors could, facing each right, other. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It'd be like um, you know, enter the scene with Enter the Dragon when Bruce Lee, you know, walks in with all those mirrors and everything. Yeah. If, if we can keep going for week after week after week, speculating about why we got fired. Yeah. Them commenting about right. it. And we then should, us, right. And we should crowdsource why we got fired. We should. We should. That's yeah. actually really good. I'll do that right now. I'll tweet it live if you want. Why did we get fired? Yeah. Hashtag. Yeah. Why did we get fired? You know, Matt, we didn't do a hard launch. We're going to have to do a hard launch soon, but we also need to drum up some controversy. So I think which should be the big mystery. Say it to our faces. Hashtag say it to our faces, (laughs) Rolling Stone. That's right. That's right. Don't just hand us our walking papers and tell us to to go. Yeah. Right. So we have to we have to figure this out. We're going to get to the bottom of it. Yeah. So people, viewers, fans, listeners, watchers of Useful Idiots, please tell us your theories about why we're no longer at Rolling Stone. Right. And then we want, you know, the, 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 the great thing about the Vanguard is that we, as, as we watch this, we'll get more interested in the question ourselves. Right. Right. And, and that'll, yeah. it'll, it'll inspire us to dig. Well, that's what I was going to say. That great journalistic whole thing that you do, Matt, you can now apply it to what happened to Matt right. Taibbi. Yeah, because you're always you're you're always want to make sure like you don't care who gets the story. It could be the next person if you if you if you you know do the job well and the other newspaper right. moves the story forward. That's good in the end. You know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's competition, but you're moving the story forward. And I think honestly, if you show that you still have that, right? Rolling Stone may want us back, and this time we're gonna go in guns blazing and demand that we have a uh, Assad as a co-host and a fat Yemeni child as a co-host. <laughs> That's right. It would be four, right? Because part of this was the finances of it. They didn't want to go for that third right, right. host with Assad. Yeah. But now we're going to say, no, now, you know, on our terms, it's on our going to be just three. It's, it's going to be four. Be, it's going to be four. Now, One of them is going to be a fat Yemeni child. <laughs> I'm sorry. We can just say F. Uh, FYC is what we call them. <laughs> FYC. And no, yes, it's true. It's going to be a short, you know. Short. We short don't have an option. Yeah, we don't so have we any We want you to pay options. him an adult salary. Yeah, but right? the good thing is an adult salary. Okay, I don't want to cater. I don't, look, off the record, I know we're doing the like, <laughs> we're going on the offense, but if I could just make a practical argument, two things. One is I spoke to Bashir and he's okay. Financially, he says he'll do the show an in kind donation, he said, is what he called it. And then he may be willing to do that, but that shouldn't be a condition that we accept. You know what? You're right. Full time salary for Bashir al Assad. (laughs) And I'm just showing Rolling Stone what they could have had. Mm -hmm. They could have had that. Right. But Bashar, is that what you said? I think it's Bashar, is it? Yeah, but friends, it's an. Oh, between you, right? Yes. It's a nickname. I can't say. Right. I can't even say the nickname I usually call him because <laughs> that would get me in trouble. Um, but so here's Not what you on. lost, Rolling Stone. You lost a free Assad co-host. And look, the other thing is that the economy in Yemen means that even if you fully blow up a Yemeni child with food and candy, it's very cheap. It could have been. It could have been cheap, but now we're going to give you, now we're, we're going to charge we're gonna, you the yeah. American child fat plan. Right. Which right. is we, much more expensive. So now we're, we want four full time hit podcaster salaries. Yeah. And you want to eat candy. Right. Right. You could have had two, you could have had, sh- sh- had three hosts 
for the price of two, now now you're gonna have to pay for for four, four essentially. Essentially. Right. So this is a little, learn a business lesson. Yeah. Seriously. Sorry, guys. Right. Sorry, not sorry. So yeah. So well, the plot thickened this week because we revealed the whole series, the the uh, Yemen stuff. The Yemen Saudi. Yeah connection right yeah, yeah. I was, we yeah and and in all seriousness that's a bad thing saudi arabia should not be doing that that whole thing and uh we should have a guest on to talk about it but uh yeah oh by the way pbs had this guy on al jolani and they're totally trying to rehabilitate him he's basically al-qaeda i predict that this is gonna that this guy is gonna be making a lot of appearances former and this is this is a former leader of al-qaeda in syria and he's now coming he's now pushing the idea that he's he's ex-isis now al-qaeda leader and he is talking to he's doing a full media press right now the critics love hemingway the new film from ken burns and lynn novick you're recognized you're designated as a terrorist by the united states by the united nations by many governments look at his face he's like there's a lot of americans yeah. who would say you have no yeah, business that's me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's being me. um a leader um as a terrorist. What say ye? What do you say to them? First, we are not the rulers here. We are one part of the Syrian revolution. The Syrian revolution is not just one person, it's a people's revolution. Also, this is an unfair categorization. It's a political label that has no truth or credibility. Because th throughout our 10 year journey in this revolution, he's really soft selling it. We haven't posed any threat to the West. No security threat, no economic threat, nothing that's why this designation is politicized. We call on countries to revise their policies towards this revolution. You have in the past um, said that uh, you um, look at his eyes. <laughs> he keeps determined shift, to so fight shifty. the United States and its allies. Looks a little like Aaron Rodgers. Yes, we have criticized Western policies, but to wage a war against the United States or Europe from Syria, that's not true. Your Arabic's really good. We didn't say we want to fight. We didn't say that. We would also like to ask what is the definition of terrorism? How do you define it? I know it's pretty good. Well, Bashir teaches me. Bash. Today, every country has a terrorism list containing any person in our party or country says it's against it. The practical definition of terrorism is killing innocent people, children, poor people, women and attacking people's property. Today, these acts are committed by the criminal Assad regime. It's more deserving of this designation. Till now, there was recognition of Assad, although he carried out numerous chemical attacks, some say over 100 against his people. There is recognition of Assad, yeah. And destroyed schools, killed women and children, dropped barrel bombs on civilians in villages and towns. And destroyed great cities like Homs and Aleppo. These are historic cities, four, five, or six thousand years old. Come on, how many? Get your facts straight. But there's still international recognition of this regime. Our key message is simple. Here, here comes the talking point, guys. The people wanted to change a ruler. And the ruler wanted to change a people. Changing a ruler is a lot easier than changing an entire population. That's probably true. Well, you say here now. Mm, yes and no. I mean, Saddam. It's easier, but then what happens? Let's see. Uh, leader. Okay. Uh, will not support what you call external jihad. That you will not support any attacks against the United States. Any. Uh, I repeat, our involvement with Al Qaeda has ended. يعني كان دخولنا مع القاعدة في السابق هذه حقبة وانتهت يعني وحتى and even when we were with Al Qaeda we were against carrying out operations outside of Syria كنا نرفض we were يقام على الخارجي from the table and it's completely against our policy to carry out attacks against foreigners from Syria that was never intended nor did we ever do it accident نفعله على الإطلاق يعني so I like that he's got the talking points down that guy the the journalist is is throwing him very clear questions very good setups 
Mm-hmm. Will you say that you will not engage in foreign jihad? Yeah, gro- gro- grooving fastballs right over the plate. Yeah, so. that's it. Yeah, so I'm just saying, keep your eye on that. And uh, if you look at his before and after, my f- my thing is that they have a harder time because unlike uh, Osama bin Laden, who had nice eyes, this guy has serial killer eyes. You thought bin Laden was handsome, right? Well, I did. Much like, I mean, he was not a Soleimani, but he was ha- he is handsome. I think we can just admit that. In He's fact, six, I got six, into trouble. Six. I'm sorry. What? This is just it's just so funny that we're in this place where where this is actually happening. I mean, considering where we were 20 years ago, that the mere mention of anybody who was even tangentially somehow connected to al-Qaeda would have people running in the streets fleeing and calling for the invasion of countries that weren't even connected to the to the matter. Now we're we're actually going to try to rehabilitate this person publicly. And for people who are 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 actually going to take that as some kind of compliment of Assad. <laughs> Seriously, that's not what I'm saying at all. It's just that the American position on this is so ridiculous. There's some historical precedents. Yeah, you don't have to like Assad to think this is a bad idea. And you know, and obviously this this was a one of the defining problems. You know, there was a schism about this within even the Obama administration. Remember that that was the whole reason that Michael Flynn got bounced from the Defense Intelligence Agency because he was talking about how these people aren't really moderate. Right, that we're yeah. aligning with in, in this area, and I don't know. It just it just seems like a, a preposterous place that we're ending up in. Yeah, he's like it's like he's like Roger Stone and Pink Floyd. He used to be with Al Qaeda, now he's not. He does he doesn't you know Roger Waters. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> Roger Waters. Yeah. <laughs> Roger Stone. That yeah. band would have been so much worse. It would have been so much or better. <laughs> or, or or better. That's true. Little little Roger Stone on vocals with David Gilmore doing the. Oh my guitar. God, we got to do. We got to actually set that. We got to do that. That would be great. Yeah, That'd be great. What song would you want to have them play? Like, oh, you don't know any Pink Floyd songs. Comfortably numb. Comfortably numb. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I'm reading Syrian Girl uh, on Twitter. Uh, Ten years of beheading, severing hands, torturing journalists, and shooting women on accusations of adultery. But Al Qaeda leader Al Jalani wore a suit when talking to Frontline, so it's okay for the U.S. to support his takeover of Idlib now. Not his take, not his hot take. Yes, his take, but also his takeover. This tweet is pretty good. Uh, chilling call by Al Nusra tells mother he beheaded her son. He's your son. Where's your son now? I beheaded your son today. So Al Qaeda terrorist sick boast to grieving mother after stealing Syrian soldiers' mobile phone moments after his murder. Anyway, yeah. So he's not he's not a good guy. And I just want to do one more thing, which is do you know that journalist, that guy who was interviewing him? What we have here strong is strong beard energy there. Strong beard energy and strong uh I just we just went shopping before this interview energy and right. can, and coordinated. Or it's the type of thing like I bet if you showed up in that room, they'd be like, We did not plan this. Right. That's right. Right. right? Yeah. Just so people know, they're both wearing navy blazers and button down, like light blue button down shirts. But what's interesting is the journo, if you zoom in, he's actually rocking a kind of Patagonia thing underneath it. Underneath it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is very weird. It's almost like he's trying to suggest a cravat. Yeah, an ascot maybe. Ascot, yeah. That would be a good look for for a former El Nusra leader. Right. Ascot. Al Jelani, yeah. He should have a fuck around and find out ascot. <laughs> that would be great. That would but, be great. Agree. But then, you know. I would be all for it. If you, if you were to wear right? that. Right, beheadings, all that stuff in the past, you know. Oh, it's a callback if you have something around the, wow. Oh, that's oh what it is. Oh, my God. Right. Beheading right. callback, that's awful. See, all these dimensions that we, like, if we if we didn't do this hard work of looking at, the, at, at these videos and uh, and pictures, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have caught all these. Right, know? and this is why, this is really why Rolling Stone knew we were on to this story. Right. Before right. we, we were did. sniffing this out. Yeah, they, yeah. And he does look like Willem Dafoe. Um which one, Martin Smith? Yeah, it's. I think it's it's Willem Dafoe times Ken Burns mm. times something else. I can't figure out what the uh, third. Interesting. Third, are uh, are uh, you are you saying that because that is some powerful advertising? Because right before this, of course, it, we were going to cut it out. But if you play oh, this the Hemingway what, thing, yeah, there's a Hemingway doc by right. Ken Burns. So of course there is. What, he is does there, look is, like is, that. Is there anything that, uh, that Ken, Ken Burns hasn't done a doc about? Uh, maybe actually, now that you mention it, that that we should crowdsource. Can you can you tweet that out right now? Uh, yeah. Pl- please name something that Ken Burns has not done a documentary about. Well, yeah, but I think the answer's right there. Uh, this. Yes. Right. And our our departure from Rolling Stone. 
Right, you're right. That's what. That's really what that is. I can't figure who that third var variable is. It's... Yeah, who do you think? Wait, so y your variable was who again? Willem Dafoe. It's Willem Dafoe plus Ken Burns or times Ken Burns minus something else. Uh, that's going to bug me. It's going to bug me so much that I can't. I can't nail that third male variable. Wilson, you got any ideas? Is it Jeremy Irons? Could be Jess. Yes, that's that's correct. I think. Oh uh, yeah, I kind of see it. Right. Yeah, we should, we should also do the celebrity math on this. Yeah, we so should, celebrity actually, math. Celebrity math. So yeah, I think it's I think it's Defoe times Defoe times Burns minus Jeremy Irons. No, plus Jeremy Irons. Plus, yeah, I was gonna say. Plus Jeremy Irons. All right, all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna Stephen King. This all out. Stephen King too. Stephen King times. They're very similar. There's a there's a similar like vibe with both of them. But yeah, you're right. The the jaw is very Stephen King. And the eyes are kind of kind of Stephen King eyes. But I just want to make sure that people see if for people who are missing it, Matt uh, Taibbi, you saw that you saw his old look, right? Which is more flattering, the extremist look or the Western look? If you we mean if, Jelani, Al, yeah, going back to Al Jelani's. The the extremist look is kind of it's kind of badass. Yeah. Right? Would you approach that, that yeah. guy in a bar? I wouldn't. No, but you know, I don't think I'd approach either one in a bar. <laughs> now this one, I would, let me just tell you something, not to be too personal, TMI, Uh huh. but this guy, I mean, I think within a couple of minutes, I'd probably back away. Uh, also, I'm not sure you'd find him in a bar. Is that him? Yeah, he was handsome, right? Kinda, yeah. I don't know what happened to him. He looks like he's got things on his mind. I don't know how old he was then, but he definitely has that like i'm gonna become the commander in chief of the syrian militant group Tariel al sham and then interviewed on pbs by a guy right. who's a cross of jeremy irons ken burns uh stephen king and willem dafoe yeah and i think smith could have probably pushed back on this more although i get it when you go shopping with someone you kind of there's a special bond that develops right. But he did say that uh, he would, quote, fight the United States and its allies. And uh, he also told people not to accept help from the West in their battle against ISIL. I feel like he didn't really address that. He didn't. Uh, anyway, so but but keep your eye on that guy. And not because he used to be handsome, although it'd be great if he became handsome again. I mean, no, it wouldn't be great. So, you know, this is a new thing we're doing on the show where we we kind of live you know, we crowdsource in real time. So if we could just look at my uh, our crowdsourced uh, question. Useful idea at pod crowdsourcing. Why did Rolling Stone sever ties with us? Let us know your theories. Also, who does Martin Smith look like? Okay, let's see. So Brutus Judas writes, to make, why did we That's stay good. sever ties? To make room for Near Tandon's new podcast. Uh, Julius, you know, the thing, uh, Ditter Bops writes, just like they stopped featuring real music, they need to stop featuring real journalism. Um, Benji, Beachside Benji, uh, honestly, I'm impressed that they kept y'all as long as they did. Y'all were controversial in a good way. Regular lawyer, why did Rolling Stone sever ties with two Russian agents? Do you really have to ask? Then Michael Mialo goes, you're kidding, right? He was kidding. Anik Fasal, because both of you refused to go to brunch after Kamala was sworn in. Oh, that, that was also a factor, yeah. Max, Max Blumenthal. Blumenthal, who's a great journalist. PetSmart dropped their sponsorship after learning you were anti-shark. Mm. Maybe uh, necrophilia is a bridge too far mm -hmm. because you found out Kurt Loder is a really an immortal like the Highlander. If you continue to pull on the threads of the conspiracy it would have had profound global impact, which is true. I like this one. This is good. The sarcasm what? energy on this is great. Which one? Because your ads, ad reads with Matt were just too good. Mm -hmm. Maybe the woke dead were threatening to me too, Katie. <laughs> Uh, they finally realized the name of your show was irony they felt bad about holding you back i'm on you fly free i like that having a drum kit in the picture and never playing it live is an insult for music magazine that can only last too long big shark and big necrophilia really put pressure on <laughs> they the learned point. your plan to restore the ussr you violated the pun limit clause in your contract that may be uh, uh -huh. true uh, they're distancing themselves in the event of imminent necrophilia charges too many tanky takes and guests hurt credibility Rob Green, uh, because Saudi paymasters are different than Russian ones. He's serious. He actually hates us. Uh, yeah. So what do you think that is? A I don't actually know what that means. That's the re reference to this new thing, the, the con conspiracy theory about uh, Rolling Stone being 
run by. Okay, Saudi so Mali. we're okay, so we're paid by the Russians, not um, right. too many bad attempts at humor. We can't skip that. Out. We skip over. Yeah, that. they are anti necrophilia, obviously. Too many bad attempts at humor. I don't take that, that was too serious. Boring. So we got some good responses. Yep. Absolutely. Those are funny. Oh, wait, do we get Martin Smith? Hold on, hold on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Martin Smith, who do we got? Gary Cole, Walter White, Martin Gary Sheen. Cole. I said Martin Sheen. Martin Sheen, you did say Martin Sheen. Mm -hmm. Like someone who needs a lot of alcohol. Pissell without the beard. There you Ooh, go. Okay, David Tennant. David Tennant. That's a good one. Pacino. Isn't that Gary? Who is Gary Cole? He's the, he's the guy who played Lumberg in, um, you know, Office Space. Peter, uh, if you could just go on ahead and come in. Oh, he today. does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kim yeah. Stanley Robinson. Hugh Grant or Kevin Bacon in City on a Hill or Putin, but everybody looks like Putin. Uh, Dr. House. Oh, yeah. Uh, if he took depressants instead of Vicodin. Yeah, maybe. that's true. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, obvious. Uh, withered Christopher Walken. Those withered. are all good options, though. Yeah, they are good options. Yeah. I think uh, Gary Cole, Martin Sheen, those are both winners. He's going to be mad at us. Honestly, be mad at us because we're calling you out for being like an ISIS rehabilitator. That's me saying that, not Matt. Right. I'm all for that. We're excited to introduce a guest who, I hate I hate this cliche, but who really needs no introduction, Noam Chomsky, who is a, uh, a famous uh, linguist and political analyst uh, known throughout the world. He's one of the most prolific uh, public intellectuals of our time. Mm -hmm. uh, had a huge influence on a lot of people, including my own career. He's the author of a great book about the media called Manufacturing Consent. He's incredibly prolific, uh, always has something to say about everything, and he's very kind to take his time out to talk to us. And little side note, we did have Matt Stoller on talking about the left not uh, engaging in foreign policy discussions. So I promise to have a leftist to talk, on to talk about that. That's ridiculous. It makes it sound like that's why we brought Noam Chomsky on as opposed to obviously trying to have him come back onto the show. But I'm just saying as a double, as a, as a bonus, we get that. Without further ado, let's talk to Noam Chomsky. Hello, Professor. Th thank you so much for taking the time. That's fine. All right. Well, you have a new book out. Can you tell us a little bit about Chomsky for Activists and what, what, what prompted you to, to do this book now? Well, actually, I was prompted by a friend who is editing it, and uh, he thought it might be a good idea to put together some discussions and uh, interviews and back articles, other things about activism. <laughs> So I went along. The, the book is very, very optimistic in tone. You, you look back and, and talk about the distance that uh, people have traveled since the 60s. What, to what do you account, you know, the sort of improvement in the level of engagement in political activism today versus, say, back in the 60s, early 60s? Uh, overall, it's probably greater today. There were peaks in the 60s. There was a brief peak and with regard to the civil rights movement in roughly 19, around 1963, a couple of years before that, and that terminated. Then there was a brief peak in the late 60s and early 70s with regard to the anti-war movement, it was a couple of years. Uh, meanwhile, other things were being developed, barely developing. You got the bare beginnings of what became later the feminist movement, uh, the beginnings of environmental concerns, some labor concerns, a couple others, a lot of them flourished later. The seeds were laid. But today it's much broader, much more extensive. But one of the reasons for the book is there is a sense among young people that everything's hopeless. It's just can't fight City Hall, it's too big. That partly comes from not understanding what's happened in the past. If you look at the differences that activism has made just in half of my life, 50s, 60s to the present. That's enormous. If you go back earlier, it's even more. That's a really interesting question I want to follow up on because that sense of hopelessness, especially since Trump has been was elected, there's a lot of this rhetoric that sort of democracy doesn't work. The, the core functions of, de of democracy, the con constitutional protections, protest in a normal way doesn't work. And pe people are uh, pessimistic. And I see a lot of discussion about how 
Uh, there's too much democracy. We, we need to lobby big companies like Facebook and Google and PayPal and even MasterCard and Visa to do the work for us to, to sort of create the society that we want. How do you feel about that kind of sort of corporate-based activism, that lobbying corporations to do things? Well, lobbying corporations is activism. If corporations are doing anything, it's because they're under pressure to do it. Uh, corporation has one purpose, to profit. Uh, you can, if they, you know, I mean, there's variation, but very generally, the fact is that a corporation is uh, following the principle that it should maximize its own gain and market share. Now, one of the way, uh, corporate executives are not stupid. If they realize that they're losing a customer base, uh, they're facing what they call reputational risk, uh, meaning the peasants are coming with the pitchforks, we better do something, then they'll react and uh, maybe do something, you know, sort of generally decent within limits. But that's uh, to ask them to do it on their own is makes no sense, like asking a, a totalitarian state to be nice, you know, maybe it would be under pressure. But, uh, so, but the real changes are taking place not, I mean, the corporations are being sort of dragged along slightly, but the real activism is having other effects. I mean, take the most important issue we face by far, uh, destroying the environment. We don't solve that quickly, nothing else is gonna matter. And we don't have a lot of time, decade or two. Well, there, it's not gonna come from corporations. In fact, take a look at this morning's papers. The, uh, even with the pandemic and the reduction of economic activity, uh, methane and carbon dioxide uh, 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 release into the atmosphere has increased uh, because for example, the uh, as oil prices have gone up, you're getting the automatic reaction, fracking industry revives. Uh, Trump, one of his great deeds was to de eliminate the regulations on controlling methane uh, release, which is extremely dangerous in the short term, much more dangerous than CO2. So they do that, they can make more money that way. Uh, so you're getting more release of poisons into the atmosphere, which reduces the time span that we have to try to, to deal with this. Well, that's the way businesses are going to behave. They can make more money doing something, they'll do it. Uh, you put plenty of pressure on them or on the banks that finance them may impede it. But if you do things like what Sunrise Movement did, an active young activist group, sit in, occupy congressional offices, get some support from the progressive legislators who came in kind of on the Sanders wave, uh, Alexandria Cortez in this case, uh, pick up some support from a democratic, long-term democratic senator who was interested in the environment, Edward Markey, then you can get uh, green, the idea of a Green New Deal, which is essential for survival in some form. You can get it from way off the, in the, in the you know, outer space somewhere to the legislative agenda. Keep the pressure up, you can get something done. Uh, we can see it happening right before our eyes. So Biden, Biden's environmental program, climate program, it's not it's not what's needed, but it's much better than anything that preceded. And it's not because he had a, a sudden revelation. Uh, there's pressures constantly. In fact, within his administration, they have brought in, sometimes at a pretty high level, uh, people who are pressing for these things. That's the result of the constant engaged activism. So yes, it has effects, which you can see, but the effects wouldn't be there if it wasn't for the activism that lies behind them. It's the same with everything. I mean, take, say, the civil rights movement. 
uh, the things you think about are Martin Luther King giving a speech on the mall, you know, the National Mall, and I have a dream and so on. So a lot of work went into that. People whose names you don't know, and I don't know. Uh, people who were riding freedom buses in the South to try to encourage uh, black farmers to take the risk, and it was a severe risk of daring to cast a ballot, suffering, some getting killed, uh, gone from history, but they made history. Finally, you get something happening, didn't happen by itself. Same on every single thing you can think of. Basically, get back to the question about the book, that's what it's about, try to get people to understand this is the way things happen. I mean, if you want to take, say, the the protest about the Vietnam War that began in the late 60s, it took, became really substantial in the late 60s, 67, 68, you're getting huge demonstrations. Uh, early in the 60s, couldn't get a whisper. I, mean, I, I was giving talks in somebody's living room. You get three neighbors together. Uh, that's other people doing the same thing. When we try to have a meeting at the university at, uh, to bring in Vietnam, we had to have 10 other subjects to bring somebody in. Well, it takes a lot of work like that by lots of people before anything finally breaks through. You may not see it for a long time. You may forget the people who were involved, but that's the way things happen. And the same is true today. And it is happening on a lot of fronts. I'll take, say, the, uh, the uh, demonstrations that took place uh, after the Floyd murder. Pretty astonishing. There's never been anything like that before. I mean, the, there was some real dedicated solidarity, black and white, all over the country, all over the world, in fact. Uh, enormous public support, way beyond anything that Martin Luther King achieved. That didn't come because one black man was murdered by the police. It came from years of activist organizing and education. Uh, I mean, take say, shortly before that, the New York Times had published its uh, uh, series, 1619 series. That wouldn't have happened a couple of years earlier. It was the result of changes in understanding, commitment, dedication, take place slowly because lots of people are working on it. Otherwise it wouldn't happen. Uh, that was good stuff. And guys, we say this, can't say it enough. Please subscribe to our show on Substack. That is usefulidiots.substack.com. Uh, rate and review us, uh, our podcast, share the love and you know, we know that you love the show, and if you love this show, you're going to want even more show. And the way you get more show is you donate. You pay. Pay for play. Pay for play. That's what the show is about at, so, at uh, usefulidiots.substack.com. It's very affordable, and we give you extended interviews, behind-the-scenes stuff, extra segments. And this week's Substack only is an extended interview with Noam Chomsky. Use the hashtag uh, usefulidiotspod. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to send us abusive questions, if you do it in video form, we will actually will show yeah, it. Yeah, we will. Yeah, you can say basically anything. Yeah, uh, and we'll show it, but yeah. you have to actually be on camera. Awesome! Thank you so much, and see you next time. Yeah.